वेलकम टू पार्टी स्ट्री Today we are going to discuss about humanism and renaissance art. The discovery of the classics resulted the emergence of humanist ideas. The identification of human dignity with moral freedom suggested an ideal of man different from those of the Middle Ages. The humanist conception of a desirable human being was less specialized the ideal man was noble but his nobility his gentleza unlike the knights was based not on birth but on virtue and his virtues unlike the monks were not exclusively ascetic and contemplative the humanist idea of perfection included both mind and body contemplation and action the good of soul and what contemporaries call the goods of fortune wealth physical beauty and health man contemplates to the extent that his soul is divine and separate but as a man a composite of soul and body living in the world he exercises the moral virtues and he is useful to all according to alvetti man was born to be useful to man the good painter wrote leonardo da vinci must paint principally two things man and the ideas in man's mind because leonardo's contemporaries did indeed choose these as their subject few sources make so attractively explicit the humanist philosophy of man as do renaissance works of art the poems orations moral essays histories and educational treatises of even the greatest humanists are little read today except by specialists since most of them are written in latin only specialists can read them the paintings statues and buildings of renaissance artists are more accessible even to moderns more easily moved by african masks than by the nigerian aphrodite renaissance art was a humanist art in its sources its content and its style Consider the allegory of philosophy by Albert Dürer. The woodcut illustrates, perhaps with more learning than charm, a volume of love poems written by the German humanist Konrad Keltis and published in 1502. Dürer's woodcut is humanist in another way. It illustrates a humanist ideal of knowledge. The central figure is a woman sumptuously gowned and jeweled wearing a crown and seated on a throne a tag identifies her as philosophy the literary source for both Celtis and Durer is the opening paragraphs of the popular consolation of philosophy by the late roman moralist and scholar boethius The idea of humanists included virtue as well as knowledge and virtue was thought to be more important. In 1502, Andre Mantegna finished his Minerva expelling the vices from the grove of virtue which he painted for Isabella de Este, Marchioness of Mantua. According to a program supplied by one of her humanist advisers in it he pictured the kingdom of the will and the moral choice as fancifully and pedantically as Durer portrayed the realm of intellect the theme of the battle of virtues and vices was an old one 
but Mantegna has treated it with a typically humanist sensibility. The battle is secular without specifically Christian references. As Pica della Mirandola had taught, man can become all things. Virtue is as natural as vice. Both are in man's power. The battle within him is hot and continuous precisely because the stakes are high and the choice is real. It had been argued that the humanist emphasis on man's dignity and moral freedom weakened religious sentiment. Despite the absence of overtly Christian allusions in such works as Mantegna's painting, this is not true. The qualities of Bramante's Tempietto are also the qualities of humanist pity, simplicity, sobriety, serenity, equilibrium. Its form and proportion make a clear statement about God, man and nature. The harmony and symmetry of the church reflect the harmony and symmetry of the world. God has created and ordered the world according to immutable mathematical laws. The structure of the universe is therefore mathematical and harmonious. Use of the nude to determine harmonious ratios and of geometry to rationalize nature is intimately related to the greatest artistic innovation of the Renaissance, the systematic development of the techniques of perspective. The use of perspective enables the artist to project a unified three-dimensional space upon a plane. The perfection of one-point perspective in Florence around 1420 was an extraordinary accomplishment. Another of the many instances of Renaissance culture in which crafts and disciplines that had been long kept apart collided and created something new. In the 14th century, some Tuscan painters had devised practical ways to give a two-dimensional painting the appearance of taking place in the three dimensions. On the whole, however, painters even in Florence had gone on in the traditional way, producing splendidly decorated surfaces, concentrating on details and rich materials rather than the creation of a coherent illusion of a space behind the plane of the picture. Gentile da Favriano, one of the most popular 15th century painters, practiced in this mode of universal appals and admiration. The first Renaissance handbook of painting was not a theoretical manual but a practical set of rules for the proper use of materials. When it came to the representation of the natural world, its author, Sanino Sanini showed much less discrimination than he did with regard to pigments and binder. He told the painter who needed to create a convincing mountain, for example, simply to go out into his garden, find a craggy, interesting rock and paint it. In the course of the 15th century, however, artists' idea about the nature of their work began to change. Sculptors Donatello and Brunelleschi were thought in the 15th century to have made the first break. They went to Rome to find and examine ancient sculptures and buildings. It makes the beginning of the modern notion that artists must dedicate themselves, whatever the difficulties they faced, to a full-time, lifelong search for those scenes, materials and techniques that offer the richest possibilities. Another brilliant sculptor, Lorenzo Gilvati, read about ancient artists in one of the ancient texts that the humanists loved most, the natural history of the elder Pliny. Back in Florence, Brunelleschi provided new technical tools. 
performing clever elaborate experiments on the steps of the Duomo, the Florentine Cathedral. He proved in the early 1420s that if one made a certain set of assumptions, one could produce a shockingly effective rendering of the baptistery, the 12th century building, elegant and symmetrical that the Duomo faces. By the late 1420s, the brilliant young artist Masaccio was putting these new rules into practice in spectacular frescoes. The most famous of these, which represents the Trinity with donors above a skeleton, sets the vanishing point at eye level between the realm of death and that of eternal life. The final act in the story took place after 1433, when the rise to power of the Medici allowed the exiled Leo Battista Alberti to come to the city of his ancestors. Himself a student of Roman antiquities and a brilliant architect, Alberti was surprised and delighted by a new painting. He set himself almost at once to make the artist's discoveries public by giving them permanent written form. His little treatise on painting, which had both Latin and Italian versions, the former perhaps for the learned and the latter for painters, told both the artists and his patrons that painting was not a craft but a science of a sort. The painter must know geometry, not recipes. He must master a whole range of other skills as well, notably proportions and anatomy of the human body, on which Alberti wrote another work on statues. In the course of the 15th century, the new vision of what painting should be won wider and wider ascent outside Florence as well as within it. Cultivated artists developed a whole range of practices that remained central to Western realistic art for centuries to come. They dissected bodies to learn anatomy. They learned mathematics to improve their knowledge of proportion. Flemish painters, the Jean van Eyck, developed the new technique of oil painting which made it possible to reproduce minute details of texture from granite to far with stunning vividness. Others went further. Leonardo da Vinci proclaimed that his ability to reproduce the physical world in accurate perspective made him a better natural philosopher than those in the universities who relied on their inaccurate books. Michelangelo claimed an inspired ability to produce a world more splendid than the real one and claimed that gave rise in its turn to the notion that great artists were more than human, were in some identifiable but vital way divine. And all of them agreed that artists should both determine their culture's vision of the physical world and continuously try to improve it, using their individual gifts to keep the tradition of art in a state of permanent revolution as the ancient painters had. One stunning image the Galate of Raphael will show how these general trends worked out in a concrete case, 
how artists and patrons interacted in their new environment. Art itself now became a spectacularly harmonious arrangement of ideal forms in a rationalized space with the human nude serving the same functions as the temple in architecture, the embodiment of universal harmony. Agostino Chigi, a merchant who made his fortune and that of his family as papal banker, commissioned Raphael's fresco about 1514 for his villa on the Tiber. In the fresco, Raphael chose to represent the milk-white sea nymph Galate, the beloved of Isis, sung by Theocritus and Ovid among the ancients and by the Italian poets Angelo Poliziano and Pietro Bembo among contemporaries. The new ways of representation formed in Florence the product as much of the humanist revolution in thought as of artistic practice defined high art in the West until the end of the 19th century when post-impressionists and cubists finally rejected the search for new ways of representation of the real in favor of different artistic and intellectual values. This abandonment of the belief in the supreme importance of portraying the world went along with the collapse of humanist values in other spheres in the decades before the First World War. Yet even the painters who carried out the revolution that created modern art, those self-conscious radicals who set out to teach the West an ambition, their sense of the history of art and their own vocation to alter it, if not their actual work, were only one more chapter in the long narrative of continual artistic change that began in Brunelleschi's Florence. This is the end of our today's discussion. Subscribe our channel, like our video and comment. Listen to our podcast episodes. Follow our official Facebook page, Twitter handle and Instagram. For any query, feel free to mail us. For details, see the description.